Hi, I'm Brandon Neely from the Civil War Institute, and today I want to tell you about a soldier so brave that he slept through a cannon barrage. The story of our brave soldier comes from the memoir of Charles Edward Benton, a member of the 150th New York Infantry. Their monument behind me marks where they fought on Culp's Hill during the battle. On July 3rd, the men defended this position from Confederate assaults throughout the morning. During this defense, Benton told the story of a veteran he met who had been giving me an interesting account of his experiences when the heavy cannonading began. As artillery tore through the air around them, that suddenly ended his narrative, for he casually remarked, That always makes me sleepy. Wake me up if my regiment starts, will you? And despite the fact that shells were dropping and exploding here and there in our immediate vicinity or ripping through the trees above us, he was soon sleeping soundly on this grass. This is one of my favorite anecdotes from the Battle of Gettysburg. It's almost absurd to imagine the cannon shells tearing through the trees, the incredible volume of explosions, and the fear and adrenaline surging through the veins of soldiers like Benton. How on earth could a soldier simply lay down here and take a nap? Unfortunately, Benton does not name the veteran he spoke to, but luckily this is not the only mention of such an event in the historical record. At the Battle of Whitehall, for example, Massachusetts soldier Edward Rogers threw himself to the ground as an artillery barrage flew overhead. As the ordnance boomed, Rogers remarked, It seems almost incredible, but I am certain of the fact that while in this situation I slept soundly for some time, how long I cannot tell, as all that I recall is the fact that I became conscious of waking from a condition of absolute insensibility to all earthly concerns. In another instance, Lieutenant Joseph Sonnenstein of the 65th Ohio Infantry remarked, I just dreamed I was at home. I thought I pitched and tossed about half the night, but I couldn't sleep a wink. Then I hired a boy to shoot at me, and I was sound asleep in five minutes. I guess we will all have to do that when we get home, if we ever do. And in one final example, a soldier writing to the Portland Transcript wrote that at the Battle of Chancellorsville, shot and shell went screeching over our heads like so many demons from the infernal regions, the former plowing up the ground on all sides of us, while the latter were bursting over us, scattering their fragments in all directions, carrying death to many of my brave comrades, and mangling others in every conceivable manner. Yet amidst all this noise and tumult, these scenes of woe and bloodshed, perfectly conscious all the while that death might come at any moment, I became so sleepy that I could not resist its influence, but would lose myself entirely for a few minutes at a time. These are only four examples, but the phenomenon appears in plenty of Civil War letters and diaries. The fourth soldier even remarked that I was not the only one so affected, for I noticed many others around me as much inclined to sleep as myself. The image is absurd, it's almost comical, to imagine lines of uniformed Civil War soldiers napping away in places like this as cannon booms around them, but given the evidence, it must have been a more common occurrence than we like to admit. The real question, though, is why? Was it boredom or bravery? Were these men so exhausted that they couldn't stay awake once they had laid down? Or was there something about the situation that caused them to do so? The soldiers themselves ventured to guess. For Sonnenstein, soldiers had become so used to sleeping under fire that they couldn't sleep without it. Edward Rogers thought it was fatigue, saying, A man must be very tired when he can lie on the hard ground and fall asleep with the horrid screech of a continuous passage of rifled shells just over his head. But I did it. This idea was partially repeated by the Chancellorsville soldier, who felt that the need to sleep was caused by severe duties the day before and not having sufficient sleep the night previous. But this soldier guessed that more was at play, writing, The continued roar of artillery in such battles as Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg has some tendency to produce drowsiness. Finally, this idea was repeated by Benton, who summarized, Another singular thing is that heavy cannonading has a tendency to produce sleepiness in some persons. Certainly, sleep deprivation and fatigue affected the ability of soldiers to perform their duties on the battlefield, but more is at play than just being tired. Dr. Alan Gelzo's research points to a physiological basis for the reaction. Quote, This was probably the result of a stress-related spike in heartbeat, since a pulse rate which reaches 175 beats per minute will constrict blood vessels and induce sleep. This explanation fits within a medical idea of the period known informally as soldier's heart. Formally described as irritable heart in 1871 by Jacob Mendez de Costa, irritable heart was a condition identified in a post-war study of Civil War veterans. 
characterized by chest pain and an irregular heart rate, the condition presented symptoms very similar to that of a panic attack and was generally preceded by either battlefield trauma or digestive issues. For DaCosta, this was a physical issue. Something about war impacted the heart rate, which could lead to passing out on the battlefield. The best solution was rest, exercise, and opium. Modern physicians, however, would draw a different conclusion than Gelzo or DaCosta. Rather than a high heart rate being a likely cause for these impromptu battlefield naps, it was in fact probably a low one. The more likely suspect is vasovagal syncope, which the Mayo Clinic puts simply as when you faint because your body overreacts to certain triggers, such as the sight of blood or extreme emotional distress. Essentially, physical, emotional, and psychological triggers such as the thunderous, terrifying booms of a prolonged cannonade or the cracks of guns around you can overexcite the vagus nerve, which regulates your heart rate. Not only does this happen on the battlefield, but it's exceedingly common in daily life. People who faint at the sight of blood, pass out from nerves ahead of major surgery, or collapse after a difficult bowel movement are often experiencing vasovagal syncope. This modern attempt to diagnose soldiers of the past reveals an important shift in our understanding of this type of battlefield disorder. Using advances in psychiatry and neurology, physicians understand that these episodes show the body's response to a stress that it cannot handle. As Dr. Ashley Bowen writes, we might call it a conversion disorder, where someone experiences physical pain as a result of psychological distress. This understanding is directly tied to our increased knowledge of how war impacts the soldiers who fight it. In fact, refined understandings of DaCosta's syndrome have helped medical officials recognize and describe similar symptoms as a subtype of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The study, diagnosis, and treatment of these symptoms, from DaCosta's disease of the 19th century to PTSD in recent years, shines light on two important themes. First, that Civil War soldiers experienced similar physiological responses to the realities of war which all soldiers experience. It is clear that World War I soldiers battling shell shock in the trenches of France, revolutionary troops struggling with nostalgia at Valley Forge, and GIs from Vietnam taking on war neurosis share a physiological bond related to their experience. Though the medical terms have changed and grown more specific over time, those who suffer did not, and do not today, suffer alone. Second, these stories show us how advances in modern medicine not only help provide the needed care to the people of today, but also allow historians to make more educated guesses about the health of the past. Historians can debate a medical diagnosis of a historical figure in the same way that they can debate the actual location of a regiment on a battlefield, and these scholarly debates create an understanding of the past that is richer and more accurate. For example, my research points to vasovagal syncope being a likely cause for these Civil War sleep sessions rather than Benton's unexplainable side effect of cannon fire. I want to thank you for watching this video about the medical history of the Civil War. There are countless ways of studying the past through economics, literature, medicine, architecture, and many, many, many more. Hopefully I've been able to introduce you to one different type of history than you normally see and provoked some thought about our past in new ways. I'm Brandon Neely with the Civil War Institute, and thank you for watching.